Good evening. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to welcome you all for this Thinkers uh, Dialogue. We have a very special friend, uh, Anil Gupta from University of Maryland, who's joining us today for this interaction on the quest for global dominance. In fact, uh, Anil is somebody uh, that I'm sure you must have read at some point in time. Uh, it is just not possible that you've not read his work, not read his book, or you've not read one of his articles, or you've not seen his speeches somewhere or the, or the other. Uh, one of the most prolific uh, ideators in the world. In fact, he is somebody who's ranked on Thinkers uh, 50. Uh, he's a PhD from Harvard, uh, an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad, uh, and then of course, uh, right now, a professor of strategy and globalization at the Smith School of Business. Uh, has done tremendous number of books. In fact, three books, which I feel are the best things that I could have actually have read on globalization and how it changed. So I, I should name them. One is the quest for global dominance. The other one being getting China and India right. And last but not the least is the Silk Road we discovered. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, he has also done 70 high, highly cited academic papers. He serves uh, as an active keynote speaker. He's been there at the Global Economic Forum uh, and done tons of things. In fact, uh, there's one very interesting thing. Uh, about a few years back, I think about half a decade back, uh, Anil did host me at a school for a session. Uh, and I think we had a little different point of views on how I look at things and everything. But then, of course, that, that has been a bone of contention between both of us. And I'll, I'll probably put him on the block today on those things. But uh, Anil, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's absolutely a pleasure and an honor. A pleasure, Amit. Just, uh, you know, on your last point, uh, you know, as some people say uh, very presently, uh, if both of us agree completely, one of us is redundant. So, <laughs> Perfect. Uh, uh, so great, Anil. Uh, so we'll just quickly dive into the conversation. Uh, so, you know, like you, you have been talking about globalization for, for most of your career. And yes. what we have seen in the last one and a half years is something very, very different, something that we never probably ex uh, expected at any point in time in the history. Uh, yes. How do you think this whole thing has changed, a whole pandemic has changed the idea of globalization in your mind? How do you think yes. people are looking at this whole aspect differently now? Or how enterprises are looking at it differently? Or how governments are looking at it differently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, you, know, you know, the uh, if we look at the narrative, so, you know, kind of there are, almost like two tracks in terms of how globalization is changing. Uh, so one is the narrative, which is what you read in the Economist of Wall Street and elsewhere. And the second is what I would call ground truth. The narrative is uh, that uh, globalization is dead, okay? Or in fact, is on the glide path to history. Uh, and, you know, you see all articles in foreign policy and elsewhere titled the end of globalization, okay? Uh, and so that's the narrative. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the if we look at the narrative side that during the pandemic, uh, obviously uh, global trade uh, came to pretty much, no, I wouldn't say a halt, but took a massive dip. The, but there is the other side of it, which is what I say the ground truth is that you know, it's like in the monarchies in Britain or elsewhere, uh, the king is dead, long live the king, because you have the new king who is appointed. Similarly, globalization is dead. And by that, what I mean is the old globalization is dead or dying, but it's the new globalization, which is actually long live the new globalization. And the new globalization is actually far more robust and far more economically important than the old globalization. Now, to add some uh, kind of color, if you will, or concreteness, uh, that if you look at physical uh, trade, you know, physical goods trade, uh, which is really in terms of interconnectedness among countries by atoms, if you will, that that, uh, while it took a big hit during the pandemic, that has already been on a decline for the last, uh, I would say 13, 14 years since 2008. And by some measures, it's been on decline already since the mid 1990s. Uh, so for example, around 2008, uh, global trade, physical goods trade divided by world GDP was around 50%. And it's been on a fairly steady decline. It was at 43% in 2019 before pandemic. And last year figures are 42% uh, 
Okay, yeah, it took a, a hit, but it's not like pandemic was the only story. Uh, this, you know, predated Trump, predated uh, the US-China trade war, predated Obama, all of that, okay? And the reason, of course, why that is happening is because end of the commodities boom, uh, in terms of you know the, the 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 not the new rare earth commodities, but you know coal and iron ore and oil and things like that. The uh, but of course rise of e-commerce, which means uh, shorter, more responsive supply chains. Uh, so a number of factors why physical goods trade <clears throat> has been in on the decline already. Another measure from the mid 1990s, if you look at growth rate, annual growth rate in physical goods trade divided by annual growth rate in world GDP. It was at 3x in the late 1990s. It's almost like a straight line from 3x to 2.5x to 2, 1.5. And then last five years, it's been at 1x. Uh, so therefore, you know, this end of the old globalization is not a new story. Uh, I mean, this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, and it's interesting that people people are somehow surprised that uh, lo and behold, you know, the pandemic somehow brought the end of globalization. Now what's rising in its place is really connectedness by bits rather than by atoms, which is, you know, the rise of digital globalization and it's playing out in many different ways. Uh, so first, for example, uh, you have just, if you look at what people and not just people in the developed economies, but also emerging economies, what people spend their money on. There is a growing share of what we say digital goods or di digital services, okay? Entertainment, for example, just look at in India uh, uh, and so, or sports and so on. So, so when people consume uh, digital goods, some of that is locally created, but a lot of that is cross-border. Uh, you know, if you watch Game of Thrones or whatever on, uh, say, Netflix or uh, uh, Amazon Prime, that's actually cross-border movement of data. Then uh, you have, of course, the digitization of existing goods. You look at cars, for example, and this is just the early stages. But, you know, the, 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 we can predict with pretty high confidence where the future is headed. Uh, cars historically have been totally analog products. You look at electric vehicles, and then of course autonomy is coming, uh, and those are digital products. I mean, physical plus digital. And so even after you buy a car, just like an iPhone, the software keeps getting upgraded all the time. Uh, and so therefore over the air upgrades, and that upgrading is uh, often in fact means cross-border flows of data, uh, uh, you know, rather than the movement of physical goods. Same thing is true of wind turbines, same thing is true of iPhones and lots of other connected products. Uh, the internet of things will just kind of accelerate, add fuel to that fire, if you will. But some other things, for example, you look at scientific collaboration. During the pandemic, you know, there were more than a hundred uh, uh, vaccine development efforts around the world. Almost all of them were cross-border uh, efforts. And this cross-border collaboration is again, it's digital collaboration. It's not going away. It's gonna you know, uh, uh, be even bigger uh, in the future because people know that that is how you uh, do science and technology development on an accelerated basis. Uh, add to that the diffusion of ideas, diffusion of business models, you know, Entrepreneurs, in, whether it's in India or in China or Nigeria or elsewhere, they are constantly scouting, uh, uh, you know, scouting the world for ideas. And it's like, you know, the, uh, a new business model might get invented, let's say in Silicon Valley, for example. You know, it's only a matter of weeks before some entrepreneur somewhere uh, is trying to replicate that on domestic soil. But, you know, diffusion of ideas is not just at the level of business models, if you will, a new models, it's also at the level of, you know, just consumption. You know, if I, as an individual, speak with my family or friends in India, you know, we talk about, hey, you know, what are you buying? What do you do? And so on, etc. And of course, this fuels, in, in some sense, diffusion of what I could buy. And of course, similarly, if uh, my family members or friends in India, uh, you know, if, uh, let's say, their demand patterns change because of conversations with me, even though it may be free conversation on a WhatsApp, uh, but then that leads to, of course, producers coming into being to meet that kind of demand uh, and so 
upon. But you also look at some other types of new developments in the globalization. Uh, so, you know, just what pandemic did uh, is that it made just like, I mean, you and I are con con talking just now, we are talking on Zoom. Uh, we are separated by about eight, 9,000 miles uh, and so on. And it's very comfortable. Uh, you know, it's, it's like when I teach, uh, you know, it, in March last year, it was very awkward. Uh, but, you know, by October last year, it was natural uh, that, you know, uh, education in an MBA, EMBA class will happen online and it'll be as effective. Uh, in fact, if anything now, there is growing demand that maybe uh, uh, courses by over Zoom is better. Uh, than, than say physical uh, interaction. So what, and similarly companies work from home, uh, you know, was awkward about a year back or you know, 15 months back, work from home is now becoming, as certainly for white collar work, a lot more widespread globally. What does that mean in terms of globalization? What it means is that now a company, whether it's in the US or in Germany or in India, if you want to access talent, Let's say an American company, Silicon Valley company wants to access talent in India. Historically, you would open an office in India, right? Of course, there's still going to be merit in that. But now you have another channel is that if Twitter wants to hire people in India, you can add people in your Twitter India office or they can just be remotely connected. So therefore you can do uh, the interviewing, the whole recruitment process, and actually ongoing working. You know, you can be part of a global team rather than part of an Indian team. So, so talent uh, has globalized in terms of access to talent. But you also look at uh, the another aspect of globalization is what I would say the harmonization, if you will, or developing harmonization of regulations, of policies by governments. So you look at, for example, at global warming. Uh, Okay, now obviously uh, the, uh, the increasingly countries around the world and governments around the world uh, are uh, beginning to act in concert. Uh, you look at taxation, corporate taxation, right? And so the agreement uh, at the G20 level uh, on a worldwide approach, worldwide minimum on corporate taxation. Uh, so therefore, this is the new era of globalization. What is happening is, that connectedness by atoms is dying, connectedness by bits is increasing, and in fact, the economic implications of connectedness by bits are far stronger, far more robust uh, than the implications of connectedness by atoms. Just to you know, kind of close off on this part of our conversation is that you know, if you uh, look at the analogy of uh, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach the man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Giving a man a fish is like trading in physical goods. Teaching the man how to fish is like digital connectedness by bits. Okay, and so impact on productivity within countries because of the connectedness by bits is far stronger, far more important than the in, in, in impact on productivity of countries through connectedness by atoms. So that would be kind of how I see the era of globalization morphing. So, uh, Anil, uh, am I audible to you? Yeah, 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 indeed, totally. Yes, yes. So Anil, this is very fascinating, but I have tons of questions that arise in the mind as to what you're saying. Yeah. So one is, of, uh, of course, if you, if you really look at what you're saying, that we are moving from atoms to bits, I absolutely agree. Uh, so that, but what we see is that it is going to tremendously affect industries across the board. It is going to affect the way competition Every happens. Industry. Uh, so it is going to affect the way competition happens, how do we really look at consumers, customers, uh, it might actually be say markets of one, or you're talking about micro markets, as you actually put it across in one of your uh, books. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. if you really look at it, that change is going to be so profound. Uh, yes. And especially say the industry that you operate in, which has been the slowest of them to change, has suddenly been put into a fire. And it's just changing very, very rapidly. So the, the yes. whole idea of education might have change as well. So how do you really look at this? Like, uh, it is just not going to be about just putting 
uh, what I call uh, operating system in cars and everything, it is going to be far bigger uh, than what we are what we are even anticipating or thinking of at this point. Yes. yes. So I mean, you know, maybe uh, one industry, and obviously the implications will be different for different industries because you know if you are talking about social media, whether it's a Facebook or a Twitter or Snap. Uh, uh, etc. You know the implications will be different as compared to if you are talking about retail. Uh, but let's take one industry which is automotive, uh, because uh, automotive is one of the biggest industries in most economies, one of the biggest uh, globally, and the automotive industry is going through right now the biggest, uh, fastest, uh, uh, revolutionary change. Uh, in the last 120 odd, 130 odd years of the auto industry. And of course, I mean, you have the electric, uh, you have the autonomy, you have the connected car, okay? Uh, you have, of course, ride sharing and so on. So several uh, different changes. Now, uh, the in this uh, transformation, in this disruption of the auto industry, Industry. And in many ways, I mean, of course, it's disruption in chemistry, disruption in the mechanics and so on, but it's also a disruption in terms of a Tesla is a much more of a digital product. Uh, and Elon Musk has already, in fact, you know, Tesla has announced that uh, if people want a certain level of autonomy, uh, they would pay a subscription of $200, $199 a month. Okay, and so it's like, you know, Tesla becoming like an iPhone on an app. If you consume, you pay. Uh, so, uh, so, so now in this morphing in the auto industry, that companies, whether they are General Motors or uh, Jaguar Land Rover or Volkswagen or Ford or Toyota and Nissan and so on, etc., uh, is that there would be some, uh, let's say, companies that figure out how to make the transformation, and some eventually will die. Uh, okay, because that's been the history of all transformations. Uh, 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 across industries over time in every country. Uh, the, but you know, I like in this transformation in terms of implications for companies is that when this disruption is obvious and it's inevitable, it's no longer kind of maybe, it's here. That even though a company might be quote unquote late, but as Jeff Bezos likes to say in his, uh, or, you know, used to when he's no longer CEO of Amazon, but uh, you know, as he has historically said, is it's still day one. So you know, it's like if things are shifting from atoms to bits, and if you are ahead of the game, great. If you are, let's say, at the uh, you know uh, average level, okay, fine. But if you, even if you are a laggard, it's still day one because if you don't try to change to the new era, you are going to die. And I think, you know, I mean, to me, uh, from India, uh, a fantastic example is, of course, reliance. You know, what Mukesh Ambani has done. You know, and people say data is the new oil, okay? Now, of course, you know, it's hard to imagine any other company in the world, uh, and of course, oil companies are all large companies, that has made the shift from oil to data uh, in as impressive a manner as Mukesh Ambani has done. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, like uh, Reliance is an amazing story in terms of uh, how to even create a business model. In fact, their new results are just out. Their average revenue per user is just about 134 rupees. And the profitability is tremendous. So, about 3,000, 4,000 crores in terms of profitability. So, it's a very, very interesting business model. And I think we can so we're able to talk about it for hours. But coming yeah. back to our uh, question, uh, of the whole idea of uh, globalization, you made a very important point, and that was harmonization of regulation. Yes. Uh, and when, when you talk about global warming, yes, it seems that there is some harmonization that is happening. But there also seems to be a lot of divergence in views of countries and that they really want to regulate, say, data or saving of data, where it should be, how should the corporates behave, uh, how social media should actually be uh, uh, looked at, and how interactions in social media should be looked at. So yes. There seems to be a lot of dissonance there as well, and which is Very causing true. a lot of shrillness in the system. Very true. So, so there I would say, and in fact, I mean, you know, India uh, uh, is a party to this, uh, let's say, these growing tensions, if you will, on this particular issue. You know, but I would look at, and this is really around the whole question of data 
And, you know, when we say uh, data is the new oil, uh, and of course, countries historically have regarded oil as their national resource, uh, that countries and governments are beginning to think of data uh, on their people as the national resource. Uh, and so, of course, you know, because there are three ways in which uh, data can be uh, kept domestically or not. One is that uh, the, the data can move across borders uh, without any restriction. So uh, that's one uh, uh, you know, approach. Second approach is what's called mirroring, which is that the uh, data uh, uh, would, can move across borders, but one copy of the data must be stored and accessible locally. The third is that the data has to be stored locally only, and it simply cannot move across borders without permission from the government. Uh, now, of course, and this is where, uh, you know, I mean, there are companies, whether, uh, you know, and typically it's the global multinationals, whether it's in financial services, credit cards, or, uh, you know, social media, and so on, that would like uh, basically free flow of data across borders. And governments, uh, many governments, India being among them, uh, would like that data to be stored only locally and not even mirroring. But all of these tensions, actually are around what I would say, personally identifying information, which is around consumer level information, whether it's your credit card transactions or your you know, postings on social media or whatever. However, and, and yes, and there actually, the tensions are not just specific to India. I mean, they're also Europe, right? And the GDPR in Europe and many other, China, of course, you know, complete uh, uh, wall around individual data. So, I, I think that and there, it's not just data nationalization or nationalism, but it also has to do with issues of privacy, okay, uh, and so on. So I think increasingly I see uh, what will happen is that personal data at the individual level, where the individual can be identified rather than aggregated data for the whole country, things like that, that is likely to, you know, to remain a bone of contention. And the, when the dust settles, uh, probably it will be that certain types of data has to be local only and certain can be mirrored, okay? But it's unlikely that free flow of data. However, when we talk about connectedness of countries by bits rather than atoms, individual data flows are not the only type of data we are talking about. B2B, corporate data, scientific collaboration or you know like the, the 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 data flow that's happening right now i mean when you and i are conversing or when i talk to my friends and family in india or you know uh, elsewhere that or you know let's say i do a keynote uh, uh, which i'll be doing uh, in four weeks uh, you know via zoom so that kind of data flow is not regulated no country including china or india are concerned about that kind of, if you will, corporate data flow across countries, you know, ex with some exceptions, if it's defense related and so on, et cetera, yeah. but fundamentally. So I think, you know, if you look at data flows, individual level, yes, there would be restrictions. Uh, if you look at corporate level, likely to remain by, by and large free flow. And of course, scientific collaboration, okay, would remain free flow. Uh, uh, and uh, and of course, intra-corporate, I mean, like Tesla, you know, whether they have a factory in uh, China or in Berlin or at some point in India or US or elsewhere, you know, I mean, nobody is concerned about, you know, that Tesla shouldn't be able to uh, share blueprints and, uh, you know, know-how or any other kind of technology across its factories and operations around the world. So that, this is fascinating, uh, Anil, in terms of like how you really uh, paint a picture here. In terms of what are the various stages or what norms would actually come in? And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But just moving ahead on this, you know, like let, let's look at the corporates for a second. Uh, well, what we're really talking about are huge success stories here. Uh, people or enterprises who have been able to understand the pandemic, you know, who have been able to exploit the opportunities that have been given by the pandemic. But uh, there's a very interesting question that I'm really asking. Sudhir Nair in the audience asked it, uh, is that uh, 
Professor Gupta, would you agree that the pandemic has in fact accelerated changes that would have otherwise probably taken a decade or so to reflect? And the laggards have found it difficult to reinvent themselves. So what it means is there could be a lot of corporates who are just going to fall on the wayside. Now, is it going to be one of those survival of the fit? A lot of uh, uh, what I call another kind of a bust that we are actually seeing in the years to come. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, fundamentally, uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, because, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, just at the top level, if, uh, you know, you were allowed to say only one sentence about the change that the pandemic has brought about, uh, it would be, I mean, besides, of course, all the horror and suffering and so on, uh, that what the pandemic has done is to digitize the global economy, including obviously every national economy. And it has uh, accelerated the changes that would have taken place over five to 10 years, they have taken place in one year. Uh, and so that's why, of course, you know, you look at big tech and how the, the stock price of whether it's a Google or a Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, how the, the stock prices of tech companies have soared because they are the enablers and the beneficiaries of digitization. Uh, now, the uh, companies that historically have not been players or any big players in digitization are at the, and are at the receiving end of this transformation. Uh, then, of course, some will die. Uh, and some will die because it's a little bit like a horse buggy company, uh, you know, more than 100 years back that, you know, you, you can say, yeah, but the horse buggy company, if they were really smart, they could become a car company. Not really, right? <laughs> I mean, so therefore, you know, for uh, some companies, uh, it would be just, uh, you know, it's like bad luck. You know, you toss a coin and uh, it comes out tails where you want heads and there's nothing you can do about it. You are just destined to die. However, there is a whole lot of companies and a whole lot of industries that I would say are in the gray zone, not destined to die. And there it comes down to are the odds in your favor or against you? And there it comes down to that when the old changes into the new, how much of the old assets, if you will, and I use the term assets broadly, okay, uh, including customer relationships, including brand value, including technology, production know-how, locations, et cetera. How much of your old assets are still valid for the new era, for the new? Now, the more of the old assets are valid and relevant for the new era, new digital era, the odds are in your favor that if you act smartly and soon enough, you will be among the survivors and the winners. And I think that's going to be the story of the, uh, the, the auto industry is that there will be some companies that will die. Uh, but that in the auto industry, of course, you know, at the end of the day, you still need factories uh, and cars, even though they are getting digitized, you know, we are not talking about teleporting people. So you still need factories, you still need production uh, uh, know-how uh, and all of that. And so there would be the, you know, the Toyotas and others. Now, of course, market cap wise, they may not do as well as the pure EE companies that can move much faster and they don't have the old baggage, but they're going to survive. Uh, but in industries where the old assets are play a relatively small role in the new era, okay, for them uh, it's a serious challenge, you know. And I mean, for example, you know, you just look at say uh, the oil sector, you know, and uh, and uh, so let's say the fossil fuels versus new energy renewables. And I think, uh, you know, it's hard to see how, what assets other than money uh, from the oil sector, uh, you know, if, 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 if you're in the oil business, uh, you know, what assets are, let's say, relevant for the new era of, you know, renewable energy. So in that case, you cannot transform. You really have to figure out how rapidly to essentially disinvest, okay? Uh, your commitment to the old assets and redeploy your capital, if you will, in the new assets. So it's not transformation of the assets or transformation of the operating business, but transformation at the corporate level. In some sense, what 
I, I, you know, one might say is happening at Reliance. You know, it's not the oil business is getting digitized so much as, you know, capital is being redeployed. So, uh, Anil, this is again very interesting. So, when you're saying that it is going to be about redeployment of assets, so is it? Can I? rightly say uh, that it is also going to be about redeployment of supply chains. You're really going to be redefining your supply chains. Something what was happening in China right now before the pandemic, you might actually want to really move somewhere else. So that could also be one of the strategic endeavors uh, that enterprises are looking at because for uh, for businesses which are more uh, touch and feel like say oil or you might say iron ore and everything, uh, you might actually want to have more resilient supply chain as you go along. Yeah, and actually, uh, the, the answer is yes, uh, but uh, let me kind of delve a bit more into this, which is that the around the world, uh, you know, I mean, let's go. So uh, firstly, if you look at the just the growth rate of economies, and here, of course, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of countries suffered and some countries suffered more than others and so on. But one year doesn't define the overall patterns. Okay, I mean, India, for example, suffered mightily last year, but you know, uh, fiscal 2021 uh, is, uh, I mean, the from April 21 to March uh, 22, uh, India's growth rate is likely to be 10, 11 percent, right? And so, so overall, the story that emerging markets continue to grow faster than developed markets, that story remains intact on an aggregated basis. And what that means is that emerging markets are now becoming sizable entities. And when they become sizable entities, then production in terms of having scale efficient production, you no, no longer need to export from one country to another. I mean, like India, for example, right? I mean, as the scale of India's consumption uh, becomes larger, just purely economically, completely aside from any government incentives or otherwise, it becomes economically rational for companies to produce in India for India. Same thing, you know, and of course, there are going to be smaller countries, economies like Malaysia or Philippines and so on. But then if you look at, you know, uh, the region, ASEAN region, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is a much bigger economy today than it was 10 years back. Uh, and so therefore, is it going to economically make sense to be exporting a lot of things to Southeast Asia? No. And so essentially what it is, is that as economies grow, purely from a scale point of view, okay, it's going to be less necessary to be exporting from one country to another or from one region to another. So aside from the oil story, okay, just in terms of manufactured goods, I don't, I see a, 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 a reason, and that's part of what's fueling the decline of connectedness by atoms uh, over the last, uh, you know, 15 odd years. Uh, and so that will continue and become an, a bigger story. And of course, if you're going to produce in India or in Southeast Asia or in Europe or wherever else, uh, it could still be the same multinational, it could still be the same Tesla. But now, instead of cars being exported from here to there, what flows is the know-how and capital, okay? So I think that, but then, you know, on top of that overlaid uh, are now uh, a couple of concerns, particularly around, uh, let's say national security, okay? So many countries quite rightly are saying that there are certain industries which are strategic. And of course, you know, I mean, one has to make sure as citizens uh, that the government is not putting everything into the hopper and call it strategic. You know, I mean, it's hard to imagine that say retail stores is going to be strategic, but is high tech going to be viewed as strategic? Is pharma going to be viewed as strategic? I think so. And so what countries, governments are saying that for strategically important industries, defense, technology, pharma, et cetera, that we want to reduce the risks. And what that means is that you reduce the risks in many ways. One way, of course, is to, to totally inter domesticate, right? Uh, that you uh, uh, end reliance on uh, foreign countries and bring the production internally within the country. That's one uh, response. Uh, a second response is that you shift away from countries where the risk is high 
supply chain reliance on countries where the risk is high to quote unquote alliance partners where the risk is low, right? Uh, a variant on that is you reduce the reliance on geographically distant countries to countries that are geographically proximate. Yeah. Okay, because what then happens is that in the event of, let's say, quote unquote, a war between say a US and China, okay? Uh, trade across the Pacific or the Atlantic might become problematic, but trade between US, Canada and Mexico is likely to continue, okay? And so, 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 so these kind of considerations basically for strategic industries, I think are valid, logical, and are likely to continue. That's one lesson that has come out of both the pandemic, but also just the whole uh, decoupling of China that's happening. Uh, so, sure. Uh, Anil, you also made a very important point, and that was about countries which will have their own demand. Uh, that is where a lot of uh, domination of say, manufacturing might actually happen. Uh, but let me ask you a very interesting question, and uh, you, you might want to answer, you can discard it if you don't want to, but let, let's talk about India for a second. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is, as a country that we are seeing right now because of the pandemic is that uh, the poverty line seems to have actually, or the number of poor people in the country seem to have actually increased. A few research says yeah. that we have close to about 230 to 250 million people below the poverty line. So that means there has been a definite hit on the spending possibilities of what we actually have as Indians. Now, of course, there are some people who have really done well during the pandemic, but there are a lot of people who have really been pushed back. How does this affect uh, the strategy that you're really talking about? Because it can push back a lot of things that you're saying by many years or possibly a decade or so as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, so firstly, it's, in some sense, probably the most important question, okay, uh, uh, in the world, and in the at, at the same level of importance as, let's say, the uh, growing tensions with China, uh, at the same level as climate crisis, and what Amit you talked about is essentially inequality, okay. Income inequality, wealth inequality. And here I'm talking about inequality, not across countries, actually inequality on a, in terms of median incomes across countries is, the, the gap is, is, is reducing because of the rise of emerging markets, but inequality within countries. And that's true of US and that's true of Japan and that's true of India and that's true of China, that's true of everywhere, Europe and so on. Inequality within countries. Uh, has uh, uh, been exacerbating already for many years, uh, but 2020 uh, was a, a bigger hit uh, on that. And so the question is now, uh, what can be done about it? And I think uh, the it'll be a combination of things. I mean, one of course is that the there is a divergence of opinion and on how this will play out, how digitization will affect uh, this situation. And the divergence, so there's one opinion and widely uh, agreed to and, and, and strongly argued. I mean, good arguments, but there are strong, good counter arguments too. The, 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 the good arguments are that essentially digitization will create uh, uh, essentially uh, two sets of people in the society, the useful and the useless. Okay. And, uh, and so, so, and then the, 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 the useless uh, will essentially uh, live. Uh, at the mercy of the useful, okay? Uh, and so that's because AI uh, and other forms of digitization essentially uh, will eat up uh, work. Uh, and when that happens, you're going to need fewer people uh, whose work can be automated away, whether blue collar or white collar work, okay? That's one line of argument. The other line of argument is that, you know, we have heard this story uh, for, uh, you know, 200 years, uh, you know, from the emergence of textile mills, uh, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Luddite revolution in uh, Britain uh, and so on. Uh, and, but what has always happened is uh, that new industries and new jobs got created. It's just that we can't predict it. So right now we can only predict the jobs that will go away but we are clueless about the new jobs that will be created. 
but they have been always created for the last 200 years. Uh, and so obviously you can't say it won't happen again because we don't have a counterfactual. We haven't seen the new reality, right? And so both are good arguments. So I think one has to be humble and say, we don't know how this story will play out. But it doesn't mean at the same time that we do nothing about it, okay? Because we don't know. Uh, and I think one response of the, and really that response has to be by governments, uh, okay? Uh, that uh, the taxation on the rich has to increase, okay? And of course, you know, that's in the US, Biden uh, has his proposals uh, about increasing taxes on the rich. Uh, and of course, again, there are debates about, you know, what does rich mean from a tax, you know, is it people earning more than $400,000 a year? Is it people earning more than a million a year, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, tax, so, so, and what you do, you increase taxes on the rich, and then you use that money, uh, either in terms of, let's say, increasing benefits, uh, okay, or uh, tax credits, if you will, for people below a certain income level, so that instead of paying taxes, they receive quote-unquote taxes. They earned, okay, credits from the government. So you have uh, a way of, you know, cash transfer uh, from the rich to the, uh, or, uh, not or, but in addition, you uh, increase taxes on the rich, and then you invest that money uh, in, say, the training and education and better healthcare, and but of course, education and digitization uh, of the uh, poor. Uh, so I think that, irrespective of how this story plays out, whether new jobs and new industries get created or not, I don't think there is any way out of governments needing to increase taxes on the rich. Because the pandemic has just added fuel to the fire of an ongoing story of growing inequality in countries. And I remember, in fact, you know, here, uh, that was in, uh, you know, about three or four years back. Uh, so there's the US Chamber of Commerce and they, uh, you know, have every month, every two months, a uh, uh, dinner get together of people in their network. Uh, and so I was uh, uh, at one of those dinners uh, in here in Washington, DC. And sitting next to me was actually the uh, former head of the US Navy. Uh, and uh, he didn't reveal his politics. Uh, and of course I, you know, uh, would not ask him. Uh, but then we got talking about inequality. And he said, you know, that, uh, and I suspected that he probably leans Republican, uh, uh, that uh, he said, you know, US as a country has to do something about inequality. If we don't, there's going to be a revolution in the streets. Okay. And, and so, you know, have has the, the US come close to that? I think so. I think so. So I think, uh, you know, if we, if, we, if we don't do something about this inequality, uh, then uh, we are uh, increasing the risks, social political risks uh, for the country significantly. And this is true of every country in the world. So uh, Anu, this is important uh, point. And I have to ask you a political question in that case, because when you're saying inequality is not right, can actually lead to people being on the street, uh, whether you agree with him or not. But, but we have seen some evidence of those sets of things happen across the world. Uh, probably it is changing politics very dangerously as well. It is also really, yes. uh, what we are really seeing in the world is like the rise of authoritarian leaders, like where in the, you're, you're yes. thinking that there is going to be somebody who will come and solve the problems. Uh, yes. People are probably losing a lot of interest in the democratic processes. They're losing faith in the capitalistic society or how the system has been functioning. So it could be a very dangerous point. Like this is where I think when the when when you tax the corporations or when you tax rich individuals, yes. But I think corporations will also have to really look at the idea of how to really create their business models to really solve the problems as well, really have better distribution, create better access for people. Yeah, I mean, as you, you know, uh, so so uh, you know, first let's say from a descriptive point of view, and then from a normative point of view. From a descriptive point of view, it is very true that when inequality in the society increases, and here inequality of income, inequality of wealth, when it goes to 
you know, extreme levels uh, like it is, then the uh, people, the have-nots, if you will, that the have-nots, they are looking for leadership that can help them. Now, whether that leadership really has answers and policies to help them or not, people who are the have-nots, they are looking for leaders. And so, which means that the situation is ripe for populists, okay, mm -hmm. to essentially, you know, say that I have, in fact, you know, the, I'm the alchemist and I have the solution to your problems, okay? And uh, Donald Trump was uh, definitely in that mold, uh, but there are other uh, leaders around the world. So, so when you have this inequality, the situation is ripe for quote unquote exploitation by populists. Mm -hmm. And of course, by, you know, and populism and authoritarianism is kind of, you know, they are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so that's the descriptive part as to why authoritarianism is on the rise. From a normative point of view, there is no evidence that authoritarian rulers have been able to deliver economic benefits for society at large any better than say highly democratic governments, highly democratic leaders, you know? The one exception, and that's about the only exception one can think of is China, okay? Uh, Russia is not an exception because the Russian, you know, USSR, they definitely did not deliver economic goods for society. Same for Cuba or same for, you know, any of the East European countries before the fall of the Berlin Wall that you can look at or Venezuela or any country. China is the exception. But now let's look at China. The China did deliver the goods uh, and the authority, authoritarian governments in China uh, over the last uh, 40 years did deliver the goods. Now, the, the difference between China and other uh, countries is that, and we have to see now how things play out with uh, uh, President Xi, because in China, it was ruled by the Communist Party, not ruled by one man, okay? And so, which means that dictatorship was in some sense by an institution. And during the 80s and 90s and, you know, the, the, the knots and last decade and so on, that the Communist Party in China built strong institutions, whether they be universities or research establishments and so on. And here I'm not talking about the army, but I'm talking about the, the education system, right? The banking system, uh, the, uh, the uh, of course, the whole research uh, system that China, Chinese authoritarian rulers built these institutions. And then you combine those institutions with, okay, and there is kind of a debate uh, uh, among macroeconomists whether uh, culture should be called an institution or not. Mm -hmm. But I probably not call culture an institution, but it's widely agreed that culture is as important as institutions. So you look at culture, and here I'm talking about really culture in Asia, and where, you know, China, whether it's China or India or Vietnam or Japan, Korea, uh, it's the same, which is, you know, massive emphasis on education, okay? That education fundamentally is more important than sports, a very different cultural value system than, say, Brazil or much of Latin America, okay? The, so when you have strong emphasis on education, strong emphasis on uh, children's development, strong emphasis on saving. Those are all cultural attributes, okay? So in China, what happened? You take these cultural attributes and then you take a dictatorship by a party, not by one man. And, and that dictatorship now builds the institutions like uh, 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 research and science, uh, uh, like uh, the banking system, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and so on. So, so then actually the a dictatorship was able to deliver the goods. Now, President Xi is much more of an authoritarian ruler than Deng Xiaoping was. 
or then his predecessors, whether it's Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin and others. And so in President Xi's case, it's much more of a one-man rule. Now, the last time China had a one-man rule in the President Xi mold was under Chairman Mao. And from 1949 until he passed away, 30 odd years later, China was a basket case economically. So China started to deliver the economic goods when it shifted from dictatorship by one man to dictatorship by a party. And the party is like 80 million people in China, okay? And so, 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 so that's the difference. And then, you know, I, I don't see any country, whether it's the former USSR or Venezuela or Cuba, where it, it's actually a dictatorship by a party that is serious about building institutions or society uh, and where you have the cultural attributes uh, that go hand in hand, you see. So, you know, and you can't generalize from China. You know, if, you know at, at times when I give keynotes, I'm asked this, should India emulate China, okay? And I say, well, I mean, you know, you can't just say dictatorship. I mean, that's, you know, kind of, uh, it's just like saying, you know, should Anil Gupta imitate uh, Bill Gates? Yeah, or Elon Musk. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, that would be uh, stupid uh, uh, <laughs> to try to answer that question. Uh, because you have to think about really, should India emulate China? Is Can you emulate, you know, not just dictatorship by one man, but by dictatorship by a party that uh, builds the institutions. Okay, uh, and then you know if you go dictatorship route, you can't go halfway. Okay, uh, you have to go full, full scale, uh, and India culturally will absolutely and totally reject uh, full scale. So it's a, it's a, it's you know so so India cannot do full dictatorship, and if you cannot do full dictatorship, a half dictatorship is worse. Uh, the worst situation to be in, uh, then India actually, and you know, the history of the, other than China, the world has 200 countries and China is only one example. You have to look at the other 199 and it's democracies that, had del that, had, that have delivered the goods. So I would, I would cast my lot on the side of democracy. Absolutely. Uh, th that's a great answer uh, and great point, Anil. Uh, but I must ask you a question here, you know, like, you, you have been studying India and China very closely. Uh, I'm not saying that should we emulate China or what, but what I'm saying is like at some point in time, the trajectory of both the countries, or they were very similar at one point in time in the early 90s, their per capita incomes were just about the same and they started diverging. And, and, and the, the distance between the two has actually become far too huge right now. What do you think? Yes. India can learn from that journey. Uh, can we learn something? Yeah. Can we add something to our role? thinking so that India also becomes a prosperous nation, very akin to China, or probably better over yes. the years, or over the decades. Right, 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 right. Yeah. See, I mean, so the, you know, uh, uh, so if, if you look at, say, from 1980 to 2015, okay, 35 years, that over that 35 years, the average GDP growth rate in China compounded average growth rate in China was about 10.2% or thereabouts. India was about 8.1, 8 8.2, 8 8.3, you know, so let's say 8.1%, okay? And China and India were the two fastest growing economies in the world. Despite the fact that the two countries are diametrically opposite when it comes to political systems. So how can two, of the largest emerging markets or the two largest emerging markets with diametrically opposite political systems still be over 35 years, the two fastest growing economies, okay? So to me, even though it's only a sample size of two, it's a persuasive evidence that, you know, one can't poo-poo democracy and its ability to deliver the goods. Now, that said, the, uh, there are things you know, that a dictatorship can do that a democracy finds it much harder to do. Uh, because you know, in China, for ex instance, like I was once talking to one of the political uh, 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 figures in China, I said, okay, you know, if you want to build a highway from here to there, you just you know, put uh, on the map those you know, pins on those two places, uh, you know, electronically uh, maybe and just basically ask the local leaders to build the highway. That's just a small implementation issue if you have to move two million people, 
okay? <laughs> it's easily done. You can't do that in India, right? And so therefore, uh, you know, so why did China grow at 10.1 and India grow at 8.1 is, I, you know, uh, simplistically stated, but not overly so, is that 2% was the democracy tax, if you will, that India paid, okay? And that's why, you know, in 1980, the two countries were roughly at similar level and China became five times uh, uh, economic size than India because over 20, you know, 35 years, uh, ultimately uh, eight versus 10 makes a difference, okay? But the, if you look at the next 50 years, because now going back to my point about atoms versus bits, this is the era where innovation, okay? Uh, is becoming, it, it's always been important, but the importance of innovation is even greater today. And by many measures, India's scientific establishment or the technology establishment, whether it's on the government or corporate side, is far more productive in terms of patents per, if you will, dollar of investment in R&D, okay, than China's. If you look at the number of, uh, you know, say unicorns coming out of India, obviously it's smaller than China's. But if you compare China's GDP five times, uh, India's uh, unicorn production is only about a third. So if you say unicorn production per, you know, unit of GDP in India is greater. So therefore, by many measures, a democratic system like India has the power to be more innovative. And the game that China played for 35 odd years, China's GDP ultimately started to slow down. And from 2015, 2016 onwards, India's GDP started growing faster. Now, if the Indian leadership is able to manage the economic system in India well, it is entirely possible for India to grow at 2% faster than China for the next 50 years and to make up for lost time, okay? So the goal right now cannot be to emulate China because what China did over the last 35 years, you cannot do that today. This is the era of data. It's not the era of uh, oil, you know? I mean, China's uh, whole economic growth, I mean, export driven, export driven in physical goods, not in services. Can India, you know, any country in the world be uh, an export powerhouse in manufactured goods? No because the importing countries, Europe and US, are not gonna permit that because they have to take care of their own economies and they realize the mistake they did by enabling free flow of goods from China, okay? And so, so therefore, India has to play for the today's era. And today's era, actually, uh, is more pro-democratic systems in terms of delivering economic goods than pro-dictatorship systems. Sorry, I, I said like, this is so very interesting in terms of like what, what you're suggesting and how we can really uh, learn and how we can really move ahead. It's the 2% tax and we can really overcome. And you're, yes. you're even giving a suggestion in terms of like, we should really look at data as an idea and what you really be able to do, create platforms, create business models around it. And that is where we will be able to find the sweet spot. And of course, uh, being the innovation hub that India actually is, there are huge possibilities. Too. Yeah. Uh, but just a side quick question, you know, like over the years, China has had about 124, as of today, they have 124 Fortune 500 companies. India has probably seven or eight. Uh, do you think this can change as we really go into that 2% Positive, yeah. or should we should not even look at this? So, yeah, pardon me for saying so, but uh, that comparison is meaningless. And the reason I say it's meaningless is because the 150 odd Fortune 500 companies from China, other than some number between five and 10, okay, all are almost entirely domestic companies that cannot be called global players or multinational players in any sense. And what has happened is that in a large economy like China's, you're going to have large companies. And 
the and a lot of these companies in the Fortune uh, 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 500 list from China, actually the vast majority are state-owned enterprises. Okay, and in fact, one of my former uh, Chinese EMBA students, uh, he is a senior executive at one of the state-owned enterprises in China, and he told me that uh, the uh, the SASAC, you know, which is the uh, uh, state organization which essentially uh, sets policies for the state-owned enterprises uh, in China, that, uh, you know, that a few years back, they had put a goal of uh, creating Fortune 500 companies. And you do that by merging two coal companies or two steel companies or two auto companies or whatever. And if they are state-owned, you can just, you know, dictate, if you will, that thou shalt merge. And if you merge two coal companies or, or, or two, two auto companies, uh, and you create a bigger enterprise, yeah, then the bigger enterprise appears large. And now it's in Fortune 500, whereas earlier the two smaller entities were not. But it doesn't mean that you are more efficient, that you have integrated the, acquisition, the, the, the merger, or that you have become global uh, in any sense. Uh, and so therefore, to me, uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, China has 150 odd uh, companies and the Fortune 500 is a totally meaningless figure. I mean, That's, the fact that China grew at 10.1 is meaningful as compared to India 8.1. Okay, but not not uh, the the fact that India has uh, this many unicorns and China has that many unicorns, those are meaningful figures. But not uh, or India has this many patents on USPTO versus China has this many. All of those are relevant, but not not the number of companies in Fortune 500. Very nice. And unless all things have to come to an end, I think we've had a great discussion, but I would like to ask you one last thing. Indeed. What are the three top books from your point of view that people should read to understand globalization? Of course, beyond the three that you have done, the quest for global dominance, getting China in there right, and the Silk Road dis rediscovered. Beyond those three books that you feel everybody in the audience should read. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I would say uh, books that are at the interface of AI and economics, uh, because on, on the technology frontier, uh, AI is the single biggest development uh, taking place right now. Well, I mean, AI and of course, all, all the things in the biotech arena, you know, whether it's mRNA or CRISPR and so on, et cetera. Yeah, so, but again, of course, CRISPR and, and, and mRNA, they are also AI driven. Uh, so therefore, in, in a sense, we could put AI as like the mother technology uh, right now uh, and foreseeably for many years to come. Uh, so I would say books that are at the intersection of AI and economics and business. So I would say, you know, uh, Karim Lakhani and Marco Iancetti from HBS, uh, the book Competing in the Age of AI. Uh, I think that's a fascinating book. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a book I'm blanking out on the title right now, but a book out of uh, uh, A.J. Agarwal uh, and colleagues uh, from Toronto, uh, Prediction Machines or something like that. I forget the exact title. Uh, I think, I think, uh, I would say th these would be among, you know, and then uh, a book not coming from academia, uh, but a book that I read recently and I found absolutely and totally fascinating uh, is a book called Code Makers. I think it's uh, Code Makers. It's a book by a New York Times uh, uh, correspondent, columnist, if you will. And it's actually, uh, this book is about the emergence of AI, okay? And this is based on over the last 50 odd years, but particularly over the last 20 years the current era of AI and who are the players and how did this, this whole thing evolve? How did Google get into the game and how did Facebook get into the game and what's happening? Because you know uh, that if you want to understand where AI is coming from and where AI is headed as a technology without reading a book by a computer science professor, but if you want to read a book that is good, accurate and written for the layman, I think uh, uh, that's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating book. On that note, 
thanks a lot for your time it has just been such a pleasure talking to you and a pleasure uh, and look forward to Always. being in touch be well be safe thank you you too thank you bye bye